Now IGF-1 is like insulin, it's an angiogenesis promoter, I mentioned that, right? You remember that? What does IGF-1 do? It's a growth promoting hormone. Sure, it's a good hormone to have in high amounts if you want to be a 350 pound linebacker on a football team. But now you've got to know you're going to die really young. Because American linebackers, American football players that weigh over 250 pounds have the shortest lifespan of any occupation in North America. You don't want to maximize muscle growth to be two over 250 pounds. And we know that each generation has growing bigger than their parents. Due to excess amount of IGF-1, cancer rates are going up. The taller, the more you exceed the, your parental genetically predicted height, the higher your risk of cancer. Now, if you have IGF-1 circling when you're fully grown, then it promotes the, the most of cancer and fat on your body because you're growing out, not growing up. So high levels of IGF-1 are very well documented in the scientific studies to increase dementia and increase damage to the body and increase diabetes and increase, you know, damage to the brain, aging of your body, wrinkling of your skin, killing of blood vessels in your brain, right, and cancer. Very well documented. Here's a study, I have 17 studies pooled together showing levels of IGF-1 in breast cancer. The same thing shown with prostate cancer. It's not controversial, it's not, it's extremely well documented. Scientific fact, higher levels of IGF-1 are dangerous they increase the risk of cancer, and lower levels are protective. Lower levels reduce inflammation. Matter of fact, when we restrict calories, animals live longer, and one of the reasons why they live longer is because caloric restriction lowers IGF-1. So here's, a, here's the, just an example that the foods that raise IGF-1 the most are animal products, particularly dairy products, but not the protein in vegetables, not produce, because it's the protein that raises IGF-1. Sugar and honey and maple syrup and sweets raise IGF-1, yes, but not as much as animal protein does. Animal protein, because remember we learned in grade school that animal products like meat and eggs and chicken are, biologi are favorable proteins because they're biologically complete. Remember we learned that? Well now we know otherwise. We know that the more biologically complete the protein is, the more it raises IGF-1. And the more biologically complete the protein is, the more, it, it, the more it ages you and increases your risk of cancer. And we know now that the animals that grow the fastest, because we looked for what foods made in a rat grow the fastest and got as big as possible. We now know that the bigger the animal gets and the more rapidly it grows, the shorter its lifespan and the higher rate of cancer it has. Did you follow that? Do you want your kids to look to, to have a menstrual period at age 10 or age 12 or age 13? My daughters had their first menstrual period between the ages of 16 and 20. In 1850, the average age was, 17, was 17 and a half. The average age of the first menstrual period in 1850 was 17 and a half. When you eat healthy, you, go, you age slower and you go through puberty at a much later rate. And if you want to check how your rate of cancer and your lifespan, you can tell what you ate as a kid because what affected the age of your puberty? It's what you ate when you were up to the age of five or six years old affected your puberty. Those, those foods are very important, shortening your lifespan, increasing your risk of cancer because the age you went through puberty is a major factor in determining your risk of cancer. It's not good enough now to just moderately change your diet and improve it a little bit now because you've already gone through puberty, you've already done all the wrong things. Now you have to rely on nutritional excellence. It can't just be moderately a good diet, it has to be a great diet to reverse the damage that's already occurred by what you did before. Somebody said, what? Maybe they didn't hear me. I'm not speaking loud enough here. Look, if you're confused, or if I'm speaking too rapidly, it's okay to ask me to repeat something or to slow it down a bit. I'm assuming you're a highly educated audience and I can keep going fast. But here's what I'm saying, just to check, okay, just to check you got this. I'm saying a piece of chicken is like a bagel. Didn't I say that before? Why am I saying a piece of chicken is like a bagel? Why? Why? I, I want a different reason than you said to me last time. It's the second time I'm asking you a question, I want a different reason. Close. Okay, because Yes, some of you said the right answer, that they both don't have a significant micronutrient load and they're rich in calories, but here's the thing. They're both foods that are hormonally unfavorable. They drive hormones into cancer-causing ranges. 
the bagel drives insulin too high, which, makes, which promotes breast and prostate cancer and other cancers. And the chicken, because of the high concentration of animal protein, drives insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1, too high. They, so the bagels like the chicken because they both have no nutrients and they're hormonally unfavorable too. Concentrated calories, low nutrients, and hormonally unfavorable. We want to avoid concentrated animal proteins. We want to get most of our protein from plant foods because plant foods aren't as biologically complete. So you know why they, when they're not as biologically complete? So can the body make IGF-1 from them? Of course. But it keeps low levels that we need. Like the body, can the body need make some insulin in response to eating you know, a bean? Yes, it makes some insulin, but just a low amount that we need, not a high amount that's dangerous. We need some IGF-1, but just a low amount. So when you're eating your beans and your green vegetables and your mushrooms and your, and your um, steel-cut oats or whatever it is you're eating, they have proteins in them, but they become biologically complete in the bloodstream slowly over hours, a little bit at a time, so the body can moderately use the, promote them for growth and for repair of tissue a little bit here as it needs, and you're not pushing way high levels that it can't utilize that promote, that are promote excessive growth now. Because not only are these amino acids balanced to be more complete over time, but the body digests some of the beneficial bacteria that are already in your gut if it needs to balance the amino acids to make the protein biologically complete. It can digest some of that, amino, that bacteria and, it can sl and we, we slough off some of the, s the endothelial lining of the villi. In other words, the cells that are part of you are slough off and drop into the bacterial and the food mixture and they get absorbed with the bacteria and with the food, completing the amino acid um, balance that hits the bloodstream after you eat plant proteins. Are you following this for a minute? I'm saying to you that plant proteins still are able to become biologically complete for utilization and production of IGF-1, but because it takes time and it does so slowly and it happens at a more moderate level, it doesn't spike IGF-1 to very high and favorable levels. Are you following that now? So we know, for example, if we know, you know, how can I say, you know, because people, I'm going to say, win the war on cancer. The title of this lecture was win the war on cancer, something like that. And people are saying, what kind of garbage is that? How can we win the war on cancer? What kind of nonsense is that? Well, keep in mind, there are lots of populations that hardly have any cancer. We go back 50 years in this, in this world, we see almost no cancer in certain populations. And even today, in today's society, so there's a, a, a 50-fold differences between one country and another. There's even tremendous differences within this country. If one area of the country to another area of this country, we have 10-fold differences of cancer rates. Even people who live in one part of this country to another part of this country. How could we say we can't control the amount of cancer? It's happening all the time. So you have three per 100,000 in some of these areas, and you have in, in the United States and England more than 120 per 100,000. That's, you know, that's almost 30 times higher rate of cancer, or 40 times higher rate of cancer, right? And the countries with the highest rate of breast cancer are the countries that consume a lot of dairy products. Eat the most dairy, the most meat, the most barbecue, the most processed foods. You get more cancer accordingly, of course. And here's a, just a slide of the amount of produce consumed in blue, the percent of calories of produce by a country. And this slide is, no long, is not a, a slide produced at 2010 or 2020 statistics. Well, it isn't even 2020 yet, so couldn't have got those statistics anyway. But it's based on 1970 statistics. I had to go back to 1970 to be able to find countries that are eating enough produce because now we've exported an American way of life all over the world and we don't have countries eating that much produce anymore. But when we go back to 1970, we find certain countries eating more produce and those countries did not have much cancer. The more produce they ate, the less cancer they had. Perfect relationship if you go back in time before the fast food industry spread across the world. Because you, you can drive down in Laos and in Cambodia and rural China and you can see, you know, you know, they could see whatever you want. The, you know, the Kentucky fake chicken is right there. You know, McCancer and, you know, Burger Hut and Drunken Donuts. You see all these things right there in the places, you know. Didn't want to insult anybody with their real names.